right here, his word. And um, what is a common question that you hear um, after Christmas? What'd you get? What'd you get? <laughs> um, we probably, us adults, probably don't do that so much to other adults, but we, a lot of times, I've heard, like, my, uh, my parents or whatever would be asking my kids, well, so what'd you get? What'd you get? And, and that is a common question. How was your Christmas? How was your Christmas? Was it good? You know, however, however we define having a good, good Christmas uh, is, I'm sure that's different things to different people. But uh, what did you get? And um, all of us have different stories about what we get for Christmas and maybe stories from our past gone, gone by of different stories, funny stories. You know, one of the things I remember growing up as a kid, uh, different gifts that I got growing up um, over at my grandparents' house. Grandma and grandpas are great, but they are nothing like they were. They're not... Today's grandparents, at least in my experience of things, are nothing like they were back whenever I was a kid. My kids are extremely blessed, to uh, more blessed than what they need to be uh, by their grandparents for Christmas. But you know what I got whenever I was a kid from my grandparents? I could, I could count on my finger three things uh, that, that I was absolutely certain that I would receive whenever I was at my grandparents' house and that was underwear, socks, and PJs. Underwear, socks, and PJs. Never failed. I knew exactly what I was going to get. I, I didn't even have to unwrap them. I knew exactly what they were. And, um, and so that was, you know, I did get some toys, but that usually came from an aunt or an uncle or whatever when every time we went to Grandma's house. But Grandma and Grandpa, they loved to bless us with a lot of underwear and, uh, and a lot of uh, PJs and socks. Well, I, I, think, um, I think most people have their clothing stories, right? Uh, how many of you got gifts? And if you're bold enough to raise your hand, how many of you got gifts that you just assume not got? I saw one. I won't say who. Somebody raise their hand. All of us have a story, almost like the guy in the, uh, up, on the, up on the wall there. He's holding up an ugly sweater. How many of you have ever gotten one of those gifts? Like you open it up, it's like, oh, how lovely is this? And you all can probably give one of those type clothing stories, an ugly tie perhaps, or an ugly shirt or an ugly sweater. And I just learned the other day, I thought it was crazy, that you could actually go out and buy Ugly sweaters. I mean, they make ugly sweaters. That the producers, these uh, the people that make these things, they know they're ugly. They make them on purpose. They're ugly sweaters because they're kind of festive. They're, they're, it's kind of it's kind of in our minds to hey, these are for uh, these are for like gags or it, it, it helps make the the time uh, at parties more fun and more festive and and so people actually go out now and buy ugly sweaters and. Uh, the only reason I found that out is because I, 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 I was at my uh, mom's the other day, and my little niece, she had an ugly outfit on. I mean, it was just ugly. And I go, that doesn't even match. And Mindy says, oh, well, they're, they're made to be that, that way now. They, 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 have, they make outfits that are ugly, that are r- really loud and, and off-the-wall off the type stuff. It's all for the festivities, and, uh, but some of us get those ugly sweaters and those ugly shirts and ugly ties and what have you, and it was meant to be something, hey, maybe they'll, this will bless them, but I don't know. Well, you know, I got to thinking about that when we were, whenever I was thinking about ugly sweaters and those type of gifts, and I, I got to thinking about Christmas, and, and sometimes I wonder if people treat the idea of Christmas, if people treat the idea of Jesus Coming into our world, being born as a as a as a as a baby, and that whole theme that Christmas is centered around, or at least has its origins and its roots, is the birth of Christ, Christ's Mass. I wonder if people treat that idea much like an ugly holiday sweater. You know, it's something that's fun to get out every once in a while for a 
a day or two during one of the seasons of the year. It's good. It's, it, it gives us an excuse to have a good time, to get together. But really, it's not something we really wear, would wear throughout the year. It's not something we would really give contemplation or thought to throughout the year. And, and so I, I, I began to wonder if how people often treat this idea, if it's not much like an ugly holiday sweater, You see, the fact is, what we believe that Jesus did in entering our world was so great, it was such an act of grace, that when we seek to embrace the full scope of it, the full scope of its reality, then it becomes transformational in our lives, our whole lives, not just a part of our lives, not just for a short season of our year, but every day of our lives. It's, it's like an entire wardrobe change, not just something we put on every now and then, but it's like an entire wardrobe change. You know, I got to thinking as I was thinking about this message and, and the scriptures that we're going to be looking at today about fashion trends. Fashion trends are Pretty interesting, I think. And, um, and for the most part, it seems fashion seems to be such a vital part of people's identity. It seems to be a vital part of their sense of, of identity. When you look at Hollywood and, and famous people um, and just how many fashion trends are begun in the greater culture, uh, it, 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 based on their clothes. Not just clothes, but based on the hair. You know, back in my day, whenever I was growing up, there was a famous sports, a foot, college football player by the name of Brian Bosworth. How many of you remember the Boz? A number of you do. Brian Bosworth played for the Oklahoma Sooners, and he was a superstar football player. And, uh, and, and when I say superstar, I mean, he really took to the limelight. He really took to the cameras. And unfortunately, he went down a different path and pretty much ruined his football career. But man, he, did, he ever, did he have a cool haircut? I mean, if you remember Brian Bosworth, he had a unique hairstyle. And, uh, and I remember going to school, and I'd see guys my age who uh, would come to school with a new hairstyle, and it was just like Brian Bosworth, especially those guys who played football. They wanted to imitate this guy. Be- why? Because they thought he was great. They thought he was cool. They, they thought he was a person of status. And I, and, and, and I think that's probably why a lot of people seem to imitate Hollywood people and famous people, because they seem to see them as people of status, and, and they appear to have a great life, a cool life. And, and something about us wants to imitate that because we're deeply interested in significance and purpose. You know, interesting enough, the Bible talks a lot about clothing. In fact, can anyone guess where, where clothing is first mentioned in the Bible? Genesis. Genesis chapter what? Three. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Genesis chapter three. We're not going to go there, but I just want to highlight that as, as a point of reference. You know, you guys know the story of, of Adam and Eve, and God made Adam and Eve uh, in a perfect world, it, it, the Garden of Eden, according to the, the biblical account, uh, they, they were brought into this world into a perfect place, perfect temperature, perfect world, per, perfect atmosphere, everything was, was good, and it says, interestingly, that it says they were both naked and they were not ashamed. Isn't that, that's a great statement, not the fact that, hey, let's, you know, it's great that they're all naked and everything. You know, we, can, we could talk about that in another sermon. But, but the idea that there was no shame, and, and shame seems to be such a big thing in our culture today. And, unfor- and unfortunately, the church has, uh, has dr- paved the way, unfortunately, for a lot, of, a lot of things in people's lives to shame people. But, uh, but the bottom line is, they were naked and they felt no shame. They, they felt no uh, insecurities. They felt no walls of division or anything like that. They were perfectly free. And that is a wonderful picture. But unfortunately, Adam and Eve 
fell into disobedience because they, they deemed God untrustworthy. They deemed his word untrustworthy, and they decided to take matters in their own hands, and, and that led to shame. And it says, as the first indicator that they were now living in shame, it says, after they disobeyed God, their eyes were opened, and they both knew they were naked. The first time in their created state, they realized we're naked. Well, what is naked? That, that introduced a whole new paradigm uh, in their thoughts. What is it to be naked? I mean, all the, all the animals that Adam named, they were naked too. But something within them came up with this concept of nakedness, and it was, I believe, the shame that they were feeling. And their natural inclination was to cover themselves, and they began to try to find whatever they could find, fig leaves and everything else, to cover them. An inadequate covering. And then whenever God came looking for them in the garden, he called out to them, and they were hiding, it says. And, and, uh, and they said, God, you know, we were hiding from you because we're naked. Well, who told you you were naked? How do you even know what nakedness is? And it was the bottom line, it was their shame. And God covered them with a better covering than what they had. It was animal skins. And someone said, one theologian uh, uh, wrote uh, that... Uh, after the fall, uh, Adam and Eve became aware of being undressed. Then God provides for them in their nakedness. God provides for them in their nakedness. Theologians call this a first gospel. Gospel meaning good news. The first bout of good news is in Genesis chapter 3. The gift of clothing, God reveals a God who meets us in our shameful, sinful condition. And he covers us through a sacrificial death. So the first instance where clothing is mentioned in the Bible was an act of grace. Because mankind, because of his own doing, saw himself in a shameful light and God covered them in his grace by providing for them clothing. Well, clothing is other areas of the scriptures that clothing is mentioned and I, I just want to mention a few. Uh, Psalm 132 verse 9 says, May your priest be clothed with righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. Job 29, 14. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. Ephesians in the New Testament, Ephesians 4, 24 says, and to put on the new self, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then finally in 1 Peter 5, 5, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Now, what all of these verses share in common, besides making reference to the idea of clothing or putting on, is the idea that it's not an outward dress or clothing. It's not an out, these were not outward dress or clothing that they were referring to, but an inward transformation of the heart. Now, Samuel, in 1 Samuel, and we're going to turn there. You can turn with me in 1 Samuel chapter 2 if you have your Bibles with you, and hopefully you do. If not, there's, there are a few Bibles there in front of you. But Samuel was one of many examples uh, who displayed this truth, that he was dressed, his heart was dressed with God. And when we talk about Christmas, that's really what we're talking about. As, uh, as, we, as, as it denotes the title of today's message, New Clothes for, for Christmas. In Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, beginning with verse 18, it says, But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Now, let me just give you a little bit of backstory uh, for, those of you, for those of you who may not be familiar with the story. Samuel should never have been. He was a child. He was, uh, his mother was Hannah, and uh, she was barren. Uh, and in, as you, many of you know, in that day, it was, it was a huge disappointment, uh, a, a, a horrible thought, a horrible thing to be barren in that day. To, have, to be able to have children was a sign that you were blessed of the Lord, and, and to not be able to have children was a sign, or at least in their thinking, in their, in their mindset, that I'm cursed. 
So Hannah, she prayed and she agonized in prayer over and over and over again, crying out to the Lord, and then finally God answered her prayer. But one thing that Hannah did was she gave the Lord a promise. Lord, if you would just allow me to have a child, a sign of your blessing, I, I will dedicate that child to, to live in service to you. And God honored his word, and Hannah honored her word as well. And so whenever Samuel was born, she took him to Shiloh, a city where they would go and they would worship God, where the, the priest Eli uh, served. And, uh, and there she dedicated him to stay, in the t- to stay there uh, in Shiloh, to labor with Eli and to be trained, to be brought up as a priest to serve the Lord all the days of his life. And it says, But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. That linen ephod was a type of clothing that was designated for priests. So Samuel was wearing a a, a, a certain wardrobe that indicated his role and what he was being trained and raised to become. Each year, his mother made a little robe. Again, that the word used for robe also is indicative of the, the type of robe that only the priest wore, like an undergarment. Uh, every year, she would make him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli, that is the priest, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And then you jump down, drop down to verse 26. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. Now, the context and why this portion is is significant in verse 18, it says, but Samuel. What was before verse 18? Because anytime you hear the word or read the word but or therefore, you always want to look at what took place ahead of it. Verse 17, it talks about, it says, the sin of the young men, who were, who were the young men? The young men were Eli's two sons who were known and had the reputation of being evil. Now, granted, they were also priests. They were in the priesthood. They wore linen ephods. They wore the priestly garments, but yet, Despite that, they were known and had the reputation of being corrupt and evil. And it says, Then the sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Now, verse 17, But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, wearing the same garments. But Samuel was unique. Samuel was was different. You see, Samuel stood out as one who not only wore the outward garments like Eli's two sons, he not only stood out as one who wore the outward garments, but unlike Eli's sons, Samuel also recognized the significance of what wearing those clothes meant for how he conducted his entire life. You see, we can be we can be fully embraced by something. We could be fully clothed by something and yet not fully embracing that same thing at the same time. And that that example is played out in, in the contrast between Eli's two sons who wore the priestly garb and Samuel himself who wore the priestly garb, but something was different about Samuel. It was his heart. It was not his outward garment. The example of Eli's two sons and Samuel stand out for us as two realities that we face today. Those who have a mere appearance of spirituality or a mere appearance of faith, of those who fully embrace or those who are fully embraced by their faith to the extent that it infiltrates their entire life. Those who, those who, are mere, who have a mere appearance of spirituality and faith and those who fully embrace or who are fully embraced to the extent that it infiltrates their entire life. They understand their purpose in this life. They understand who and what they are called to be. There are those who treat their faith and spirituality 
like those who merely follow the latest fa fashion fads or those who merely put on a holiday sweater for a short time of the year or those who are merely wearing that ugly outfit because aunt so-and-so got it for them and aunt so-and-so is going to be at the christmas party and mom is making them where there are those who treat their faith and treat their spirituality because it's something that they are made to do or they feel obligated to do we treat our faith as the as the latest fashion fad or that ugly holiday sweater that we put on every now and then you know Second Timothy tells us in one translation, it says they will appear to have a godly life. They will have the outward exterior appearance of a godly life, but they will not let its power change them. They will not let, allow its power to change them. They have the garments. All of us have been given a new garment at Christmas. We have been given new clothes at Christmas. But is it something we just kind of put on every now and then? And then for the rest of the year we put in the closet? Is it something we begrudge wearing because we're being made to wear? Or is it something that just becomes a part of our identity and who we are? They appear to have a godly life, but they will not allow its power to change. And the fact is, what we believe that Jesus did in entering our world was so great, it was such an act of grace that when we seek to embrace the full scope of it as reality, then it becomes transformational to our whole life. What do we believe Jesus did by entering into this world? Well, let me share a few scriptures with you. Philippians 2 uh, verses 6 and 7 that says he was like he was like God meaning Jesus was like God in every way but he did not think that his being equal with God was something to be used for his own benefit instead he gave up everything even his place with God his heavenly glory and he accepted the role of a servant appearing in human form he put on he clothed himself in human form. Again, the idea of clothing and being clothed and putting on. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh. The Word put on flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Now, it's, it's important note there. The disciples are testifying, this is the one, who. this is the word who became flesh. He put on flesh, our likeness, but we have seen him. We have seen his glory in spite of his sinful garment, in spite of his corrupt garment that he was wearing. People did not see a mere human being. They did not see just some ordinary, other, everyday human being. They saw a human being in the flesh. But something was different about Jesus, something shone through him, and it was not due to his outward garment, it was due to his heart. That sounds an lot, awful lot alike what happened with Samuel. The contrast between Samuel and his Eli's worldly sons, who wore all the proper garb, but they missed the most important thing. They did not clothe their hearts with God's presence. In 2 Corinthians, it says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. Jesus was clothed with our flesh, our sinful self, that we might become the righteousness of God. I often thought of that as the great exchange. Jesus came. He emptied himself of his glory. He put on our dirty, ragtag, sinful garments, wounded garments, that he might be able to take that garment away, nail it to the cross, to be dead, to go take, to descend down to hell, to take the keys of sin and death, to be resurrected 
not just simply in the spirit, but a brand new body, a body that is not like ours, but a glorified body that is from heaven itself. A flesh and blood body, but it is not a body of this world, a new garment. And that garment is ours. That is our hope because of Christmas, because of what Jesus Christ did. He came to bring about the great exchange, to exchange our wounded, broken body, our broken self, our broken garment, that we might receive his glorified, glorious garment. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood, that is our existing clothes, our existing outward shell that we call the the body, cannot have a part in the kingdom of God. Something that will ruin cannot have a part in something that never ruins. But look, I tell you this secret, we will not all sleep in death, but we will all be changed. We will all exchange our garments for another garment. It will take only a second, as quickly as an eye blinks. When the last trumpet sounds, the trumpet will sound, and those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we will all be changed. This body that can be destroyed must clothe itself with something that can never be destroyed. And this body that dies must clothe itself with something that can never die. So this body that can be destroyed will clothe itself with that which can never be destroyed. And this body that dies will clothe itself with that which can never die. When this happens This scripture will be made true. Death is destroyed forever in victory. Jesus came to give us new clothes. He came to give us a new calling for our lives. What is that calling? Well, when we look at the boyhood story of Jesus, there's not very many. Uh, There's only, uh, the the gospels are, are limited in what they give us as far as detail about the life of Christ as a boy. And uh, two of the Gospels, it merely tells us about the fact that Jesus was born. And uh, one that in Matthew's Gospel talks about whenever Jesus was probably just a, a year or two old, a couple of years old, where the wise men, as we call them, came um, and they presented their gifts. You guys know that when you see the traditional manger scene and the wise men over here they were not there at his birth you guys you all know that right okay that was a saint francis thing but anyhow that's something else uh, they actually came whenever he was probably about two or three years old so uh but in luke's gospel we have the account the only account that actually gives us uh some details about his life whenever he was later in years as a youth and we see this in in uh, Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 2, if you want to turn with me uh, there as well, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that as we, uh, as we conclude our, the message today. But in this story, Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 41, Jesus is traveling with his parents, something that they did every year for the feast of the Passover. And again, this is, this is as much detail as we get from the boyhood uh, life of Jesus. It says in verse 41, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, Jesus specifically is 12. We know that specifically. We know it for a fact. Jesus was 12 years old. And there's a reason why I believe the, the biblical writer mentions Jesus' age. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. This is something that they did every year. It was part of their habit. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled for a a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends, and when they did not find him, They went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. 
When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Verse 49, why were you searching for me? Now let me pause there just for a moment, get back to the age thing. Jesus at Christmas, at Christmas, what we celebrate during Christmas was the fact that he was born into this world. He came into our world as a babe, helpless babe, and he lived, and from, age, and from infancy on up to age 12, he lived, we assume, a relatively normal childhood life. He played. It's, a, it's assumed that he played like every other kid. He cried. I don't think a temper tantrum or anything like that. Uh, I, I think I, I can infer that, but you know, I'm sure he fell and, and uh, scraped his knee several times, and I mean, he was a normal uh, a normal boy, well-behaved boy, I, I, I'm assuming. And, and, um, but up, up to age 12, something happened. Something happened in Jesus' life. Something shifted in his mind. Not that he didn't always have a love for God, but some, his whole perspective on what his role was, what his purpose was, I believe took a shift at this point. And they did not have bar mitzvahs at this time in history. The Jewish culture did not have bar mitzvahs. That was later on, a number of years later. But it was still the belief in, in Jewish culture and, and pretty much in the culture of this day that at the age of 12 is when you were considered to be an adult. And what did Jewish male Jewish adults do at the temple whenever they went to Jerusalem? They engaged in debate, they engaged in uh, biblical discussion, and they, they talked and they asked questions and they dialogued about the Torah, the law, and how it applies to their life. And it, here we find Jesus in the temple, dialoguing, engaging in this discourse with the elders, with these older adults, and they were amazed, they were blown away. And and, and this is why I believe that Jesus looked at his mom and dad after they, they said, Son, why have you treated us like this? Well, what do you mean? I'm 12. You know, all these years I've been itching to get involved in this dialogue. I've been coming here every year since I was an infant. I've been itching to get involved in this dialogue. Now I am 12. I am considered an adult. I am going to dive full, head first into this, into this dialogue. I am going to ask questions. I, I am going to teach because I have come to, bear, to be a bearer of the truth. I have come to, be, to speak the truth. You see, something. this story shows us something that Jesus understood his purpose. He understood what he came to do. And he was not going to waste a single second in this life without living to the full potential of what he, his purpose was and what he came to to do. And really, this, these two scriptures, the gospel uh, passage and, and the passage in Samuel, really are a great encouragement to our youth. You know, you have these young kids who, yes, it is possible to be interested in spiritual things. It is possible to be on fire for God, even at the youngest of ages. Samuel displayed that. Jesus himself displayed that at the age of 12. He had a love and a passion for the law, for the Torah, for God himself. Jesus understood his calling and his purpose. He goes, why were you searching for me? He asked his mom. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Or it also can be translated, or to be about my father's business. You see, Jesus is... Jesus probably, he, I don't believe he was wearing all the priestly garb, outward appearance, but he had, he, his heart was dressed with God. I must be, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? But it says in verse 50, but they did not understand what he was saying. Then he went down to Nazareth and with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And, and it says, like Samuel, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. What is our Father's business today? What is our Father's business today? Well, Pastor Renee read it earlier in Colossians. 
Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Notice the first uh, things that describe us is that we are chosen. We have been chosen by God. We are holy in in the sense, not a holiness of ourselves, but holy in the sense that we've been set apart. The word holy means to be set apart. We are, we are chosen. God has set us apart. And above all things, we are dearly loved. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with what? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. What clothes are we wearing today? What clothes are we wearing today? that indicate what we're supposed to be doing, that indicate what we're supposed to be about. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I kind of get this picture in my mind, you know, know, I I have a, a shirt, and under this I have a, an undershirt, and, and, and then I've got a coat in my office. You know, we have our regular undergarments and our shirts and, and stuff, and then we put on a coat. I, I can just see and envision and imagine in my mind love is the very thing that covers it all, and it binds it all together. It's the final garment. It's the garment that protects us the most from the harsh weather is that outer garment, our coats. Above all these sayings, put on love, which binds it all in perfect unity. How do we dress ourselves like this? How do we dress ourselves like this? Well, it says in verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What does it mean to rule? It means to have dominance, right? To control, let the peace of Christ control your Don't let fear control your heart. Don't let fear dominate your soul and your spirit. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, and you'll be able to begin to wear these clothes, these clothes of, of compassion, these clothes of kindness and humility. A lot of times we don't act too kind when we're filled with fear. We want to lash out, right? But if the peace of Christ is ruling our hearts and is controlling our hearts, then we're more able to wear these clothes of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. The peace of Christ, what is that peace that He came to give us? His promises that no matter what we're going through in our lives, no matter what dark path we are on, we have the Word of God that is shining before us, is lighting up the path, even if it's only just a couple feet We can trust and believe that God is with us and He is leading us. And no matter how dark our surroundings be, we can walk in surety and confidence and peace that where He leads us, it's going to lead to new life. It's going to lead to abundance. It's going to lead to joy. And it says, be thankful. Be thankful. And then let the message of Christ dwell among you, you being plural. It's plural because it says dwell among you as you richly as you teach and admonish one another. So let the message of Christ dwell among you, the church, as you are living in community. Let the message of Christ ring in our hearts. Let the message of Christ dwell among us richly as we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through Psalms and hymns and songs in the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude. So this context of worship, this context of community, living with one another, we are able to put on these clothes as we encourage each other. But it also mentions gratitude a second time, a point of emphasis. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus a third time, giving thanks to God for the, to the Father through Him. What's emph- emphasized there? Putting on love and living a grateful life, thanksgiving. Whenever we are thankful, that is, that is our, the clothing of humility because we recognize that all that we have is not based on what we have done, but based on the graciousness and the mercy of God. 
invite you to stand this morning. I don't know what clothes you may be wearing today, but uh, God wants God wants to invite you to take on His garment, not an outward garment. It doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. That's not what this message is about. It's about what's how is your heart dressed. He wants to give us a new clothes, not just simply to wear, but He wants us to, to fully embrace those clothes and take it on, on as our identity. Just like our Lord did at, at the age of 12, He understood what His, his purpose was. Just like Samuel, at whatever age he was, he was just a boy, and he understood, he took to heart the significance of the, gar- the priestly garment that he was wearing, and he sought to direct his life to be a reflection of his calling and his purpose to serve the Lord. Today, he has given us a new calling. He has given us a new life to live a life of humility and compassion and kindness and love. Maybe it, the, the, the scripture mentioned relationships there. If, you, if you're at odds with somebody, are you, have you put on the clothing of forgiveness? Are you forgiving others the way Christ has forgiven you, all of us? We're going to close with just a song we're going to play. Um, it's just going to be a, a, an I worship song, but it's um, above all. You know, above all, we, he thought of us. And, um, and he has given himself uh, for us that we might have new life, new clothes. As the song is playing, we're singing the song. I invite you to come if, if you'd like to come and pray. We'll, we'd love to pray with you. Uh, But let's just worship the Lord and uh, reflect on what he has done for us. Go ahead, Larry.